I'm Yop and I want to spend um, maybe like 45 minutes today to talk about an open source library that I maintain and um, that's also used at production here at Logmein. Um, let me actually start with like just a few short introductory words about myself. Um, I'm a senior software engineer here. I've been working on pretty large scale applications for, for the last 10 years. Um, I like doing outdoor things, so if you want to chat about climbing, surfing, hiking, trail running, that kind of stuff, um, feel free to to ask after the talk. Um, I'm also a keyboard nerd, um, building a few keyboards right now. And um, during the talk, if you have any questions, um, feel free to interrupt, um, short comments. Um, I want to make this a little bit more interactive than like a, your normal conference talk. It's user group after all. and um, so um, let me actually start with a few questions to you. Um, so who of you is writing C++ um, professionally? So every, most people. Um, and as a hobby? <laughs> okay, it's the people who go to the user group. Um, who's allowed to use C++ 11 at work? C++ 14? C plus plus seventeen. Oh man, C plus plus twenty. <laughs> okay. Um, who is um, who's working on something that would characterize as being a server? And um, who is monitoring their server that they write? Okay, so it's I guess it's a. It's a pretty good um, crowd to pitch this library to. Um, so the, the the talk, the library is about monitoring and metrics. Um, and in the context that I'm going to talk about this, um, we're gonna go back to this diagram a couple of times. Um, the red box, the red box is your application, your server that that you have written. Um, this is the Prometheus server. I'm going to talk a little bit more about this, and I'm also going to assume that you have some other thing that knows how to find all of these servers, um, whether it's a text file or your memory or um, some more something more sophisticated like um, console or Kubernetes or something along those lines. Um, so the way Kubernetes works is that your server, your application server, opens an HTTP port for Kubernetes uh, for Prometheus, and um, the Prometheus server is periodically pulling metrics from your application server. Um, and the question is, why would I? Why do I need this? Um, one really good answer is it's really helpful with developing your applications because it's a really good way to learn how your software actually behaves, especially in production. Um, like every time I've instrumented some application server, I've always been surprised by the difference between my conception of how I think it works and how the data says that it actually works. Um, it's also a really good way to get data to influence how you may influence engineering decisions that you make for development, what to prioritize, where bottlenecks are, um, what failure rates are, how your customers um, use your server. Um, it's really good to find bugs like resource leaks um, and yeah, performance bottlenecks as well. And I think you, you find probably more use cases when you, when you start looking at the data. Um, it's also really helpful for operations, um, for the people who are woken up at night when the server doesn't work anymore. Um, it can be used for monitoring. Um, we have a couple of dashboards here where we where we have um, live data from, from our servers. Um, it can also be used for alerting, so it can, it can be used to automate waking you up or not waking you up. Um, just to give you a small screenshot of what a snapshot of this data looks like, it's um, it's a little bit old. Um, it's it's really 
not actual production data. I'm going to show you some actual production data later. But basically, you create a bunch of these time series. That's really what Prometheus specializes in. Um, speaking of Prometheus, um, it's a project that was started um, by people who left Google and in their new jobs really missed one of the infrastructure that people at Google have been writing in the 2000s, which is Borgmon. Um, so they they went ahead, um, a few of them pulled together and basically rewrote Borgmon in their free time after work. And it became a pretty successful open source project. Um, there are a couple of pieces that it consists of. Um, there are client libraries. Client libraries are what Prometheus CPP, the library I'm, I'm going to talk about more later, um, is that's the library that you put in that you interact with in your application to expose these data, um, the data. Then there is also the Prometheus server, which is collecting this data. Um, it's attached to a time series database. Um, and it also offers a service for alerting based on data events that you can specify. I'm not going to talk a lot about the Prometheus server today. Um, there's tons of really, really good documentation about it. Um, I'm, I'm really going to talk more about how you instrument your application. Um, just a few words still to um, on the Prometheus server. Um, it's a as a lot of things that come out of Google, it's pretty opinionated on um, a bunch of things. Um, one of them is um, pets versus cattle. I don't know if you've heard that synonym. Basically, um, a pet is a server that you know the name of and that you really like and that you have kept running for years. Um, while cattle are more automated containers that are spun up, um, up and down and that go away all the time. And that you really don't really know the name of, and that you that you treat um, as something that is kind of expendable, and if, if it doesn't work anymore, just just spin up a new one. Um, another another really opinionated way of how Prometheus works is that it's collecting these metrics in a pull based fashion, which means that um, it's not your application that pushes its data somewhere but it's actually the Prometheus server that goes to your application and, and pulls for this data. Um, and um, yeah, it also integrates with a bunch of container orchestrators and in, in these kind of more devops -y things um, to discover where your application is actually running. So um, I think we talked a little bit about this discovery service, uh, this discovery service box and about the server. Um, so now let's really go deep into um, how do you like what kind of data do you want to get out of your application, um, and how do you how do you get it? And, and this is where the Prometheus CPP the library comes in. Um, let me first start of what a metric is, what Prometheus opinion of what metrics are should be. Um, in Prometheus, everything is a time series, so it's really common question and a common misconception that people have is that um, it also covers the use case of something of a more event logging system. Um, so it would not be something that you would push the occurrence of certain events to. For example, if there are specific errors that you care about, um, Prometheus would not be a place where you store specific information about that error. It's not a log aggregation service. It, it really um, deals with time series. It does that pretty well. And it it just says, if you want need something like a log aggregation service, you should use something else in conjunction with it. It, it purposefully does not offer a solution to that problem. Um, so a time series in Prometheus is um, something that has a name and it has a set of label pairs. And um, Label pairs are really just two strings that have some semantic meaning, but to Prometheus, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, the label pairs are really something that you would, that's really application specific to what 
what your data means. Um, for example, really common one is um, if you are counting HTTP requests, then the method post, these two strings, method and post, would be a label pair. Um, or a handler, which could be the um, HTTP endpoint inside your server that's hit um, by the HTTP request. And um, because um, each of this, each set of label pairs represents a whole time series, a, 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 has an, so every combination of a name and a set of label pairs represents a time series. If you change this to get, um, then you would get another a diff fully different time series. Um, and that's why um, they talk of label dimensions because um, this HTTP requests counter does have several different dimensions that are each represented by a different set of label pairs. Um, so I just mentioned that it's um, mentioned counters. And I um, just want to give a quick introduction of what the different metric types are. Like how do I represent the data um, that I want to measure? And the really simple, the most simple one is a counter. It's cumulative. Um, it's a single value. It it only ever goes up. And um, it can be used to represent things like total number of connections, um, bytes sent, error rates, right? An error rate can, or not a rate, but um, an error counter. Um, if I count all the number, um, the internal server errors that my HTTP server serve, that number can never go down. And that's really one of the, um, it's it's surprisingly often that we use a counter as a as a data primitive. Um, if you have something that can go down, um, that's that's called a gauge. For example, the number of active connections um, on some of our RTC infrastructure that are currently active, the number of people that are on there, um, those we would represent as a gauge because it can go down. And then the most powerful one um, is a histogram. Um, its API is it does have a single method called observe, and um, it's a uh, it has cumulative counters for buckets, and um, it also measures the sum of all observed values and the observation count. And the reason for that is that um, with that you can compute things like averages. Um, so the textual representation that the Prometheus server um, queries from from your app um, is something like this. So this is the representation of a single histogram. Um, and it's the format is text. Um, so you have a help string that is passed around together with your metrics to give you some human readable rep um, description of what the data actually means. Um, there is a type which basically says what what metric type um, the the um, the metric is, and then um, you have these lines here, and each of these lines is a different bucket of the histogram. So um, these are le means less or equal. And this, these are the um, bucket boundaries. And these are cumulative. So um, basically, um, if I observe one some value, then um, I would increment all the counters for that bucket that are um, larger than the value that I observed. So audience question, what did this histogram observe? A value between one and five, that's correct. Two, yeah, exactly. So you can, you know, um, from the from the, from this data, you can see that there has been one observation count, it's been the value two, and it, it incremented all of these counters. Um, can, can anybody imagine why they would um, just not increment this one bucket? <laughs> 
but why did they inc increment all the others? Why did they implement it that way? I think the, the representation is equivalent, um, but can anybody think of a reason why, why they would do this? Yeah, that's true, but that's not it. <laughs> Um, the reason the reason is that um, so in, when dealing with histograms, what people are really oftentimes interested in is um, the the tail distribution for latencies, for example. Um, when we look at latencies for an HTTP server, we are often interested in um, what are the worst ninety five percent um, or the worst five percent of the of all the request latencies that we observed. Um, because oftentimes those hide the actual problems. And with this representation, that's actually easier easier to compute because um, the, the database later doesn't have to sum up all of these values. So I've shown you what the metrics types are. Um, the question is how do you expose them? What, like how can you instrument your application in a way that makes it easy for you to, um, to get this data? Um, there are tons of different client libraries in all sorts of languages. This slide is a little bit old, probably there are even more now. Um, um, Prometheus, when, when I started using it, it had almost all of these, but it did not have a C++ one, which was surprising to me because yeah, it's a pretty popular language, right? So, but I, I think it's probably not been a popular language for people to write servers in at that point in time. Is there actually no reason? Um, good question. I, I'm pretty sure there was not a C1 when I looked at it and started this. Um, I, I had to, I'd have to look that up. Maybe somebody can Google it in the background and, and, tell, and tell us I'm curious now too. Um, I, I, sorry, I don't, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I noticed that, so I, I had a side project and um, I wanted to monitor it um, and there wasn't one, so I wrote one. Um, yeah, Gregor, who's, uh, yeah, Gregor is probably one of the most active committers right now. Um, uh, but we have 41 contributors. Um, Lots of pull requests um, have been merged, and it's it's a pretty pretty successful open source project, I, I would say. And um, a little bit later, we also needed to needed something similar um, for for a service that we wrote here at work. So I, I said, oh, there's this library that we could use. Um, so we also ended up um, using it in in production um, here at Logmein. Um, Yeah, so it's, it's a it's a really good question. So yeah, so traditionally this has been really written to to monitor servers. Um, we've also started using it um, to to monitor our native um, endpoints, our client, our native clients. Um, of course, we cannot have a Prometheus server somewhere that um, scrapes the ports from that we open from uh, with our customers right that's not would probably not be a, a really good idea um so for the question is how do you get the data if you do this and then um currently we just use it for for testing purposes um we also so you can extract you can use it without the server part. You can just get at the data. You can just use the instrumentation part and get at the data. Um, and then you can send JSON to some telemetry server or, or do some, something like this. So you can, you can use half of it for clients. Um, the whole thing really, um, with especially this architecture that I showed, it's, it's really only good for servers. But yeah, we've, we've been using it to, for clients also because we share code between clients and servers and it was kind of the, the easiest thing to do. Um, I think for servers, it's a no-brainer. I think for clients, you 
you might want to look into what what else is out there. Um, so um, first slide with code. Um, this is how you actually how you use it. This is from the from the registry. Um, we do ship the the Prometheus um, CPP library does ship with an HTTP server built in. Um, we're using Civit Web, which is an embedded C um, HTTP server that's really like pretty simple. Um, but for the typical scrape intervals that we are talking about, so a normal scrape interval for a Prometheus server to scrape um, um, scrape an application would be something between a second and a minute. It's like you can you can go lower, you can go way lower, um, you can go higher. Um, it's really how much data you can store or how much money you want to spend storing your data. Um, but so for these use cases of having 0.3 requests per second or so, we don't really need a high performance um, HTTP server. So so this is fine, and it it comes the binary contains it. Um, as a bundle. Um, so you can basically just um, include the library, C++, right? You can just include the library and then um, you can you can start the server pretty easily. Um, and then um, all these metrics live in an object called um, a registry. And the purpose of the registry is really to own the memory of the uh, metrics that you that you do collect. Um, so when you build your metric um, using using a, a builder, um, you get returned a reference, um, a non-owning reference to the metric that's in the lib uh, in the registry. And you you register um, at the end of the build process, you register the the metric in there, and and you only ever get returned a reference. Um, and then we also have this concept of uh, called a family. Um, and a family is really just a bunch of metrics that have the same name, like a real family, right? They mostly have the same name. Um, so you first build a family. And then, as I said earlier, each time series is represented or determined by a number of label pairs. Um, so inside of this, um, out of this family, you can add several several um, different counters or histograms or um, gauges by adding them with labels. And then um, you register the registry with the exposer. The exposer is the HTTP server. Um, and then you put code in your um, in your server to increment these counters or observe values in the histogram or um, set values in gauges. And um, what you then need to do, so when you when you compile this and run this, you need to start a Prometheus server and um, add this to a config file. Um, and then you can open the Prometheus server's URL in the browser and you have a nice GUI um, that, that will um, show you the data here that um, your application has been exposed to. Um, you can also open this in your browser and you will see the textual representation of the exposed metrics. Um, one really fundamental concept that I haven't, I, I forgot to talk about is that um, the scraping of this URL is idempotent. So it, it does not modify your data. You can um, it's actually pretty common to have multiple Prometheus servers um, scrape the same um, the same application for redundancy reasons. Um, so if one if one dies, then you still have the data in the other. And so how often you scrape it um, doesn't really matter. It doesn't modify the data at all. Only your application writes to the data. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, great. So you're basically asking um, how is this how is this implemented? 
how long your your inter the interval between scrapes would be. Like you said, the scraping doesn't really target data. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, okay. So, so how this is how this is implemented, and I think I'm I'm going to talk about it pretty soon anyway. But um, the way this is implemented is these are atomics. So in the registry, there is some piece of memory that has the actual data, and that's incremented when you call that increment on the counter, right? Um, these are these are atomics, and when somebody makes an HTTP request to the exposer. Um, what happens is that um, that creates an immutable copy of all of these atomics. And then it does a bunch of formatting and it creates the response to the HTTP request and that's then sent back to the whoever whoever made this request. This. Yeah, it's a great question. So um, the timestamp itself is actually um, not included here. This your application doesn't know about the the time of that scrapes happen. Um, that's actually added by the server in the moment that it receives the data. Yeah. Right. So you you do have a small discrepancy. Um, Depending on the latency between your application and the server, so it's it's not it's not super accurate. Um, the timestamp is not super accurate, but the offset should be should be pretty constant. And um, I think so. It's it's really so. Yeah, you, you shouldn't do if if you're if you're using it for something where latency is really really critical. Then you should you would probably use something else. It's a good it's a good question. Um, not absolute time. So like one really common use case is um, an, a histogram of request latencies. For example, these have like these have these have time in them like the latency themselves, but they the moment. Um, in which you actually do the scrape really doesn't doesn't matter that much. In, in most, I, I've not seen a use case where that's actually super important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
um, in GoToMeeting's backend infrastructure, whenever um, one of these um, audio conferencing servers receives an audio packet, a counter is incremented. A server has about 3,000 um, people on it at any one time, and they're sending audio packets every 50 milliseconds. So there's a lot of counters that are incremented. Um, um, I wrote some benchmarks as part of the of the library. Those numbers might not be accurate anymore. They're a little bit old. Um, but I, I, I think so. We have performance tests. I think that if they if they went up dramatically, we would notice. Um, so a counter increment takes 11 nanoseconds. Um, collecting one, which means, collecting means uh, that's the operation that's performed when one of these immutable snapshots is created from the, um, from the scrape, for the scrape, to be answer the scraping HTTP request. Um, that's 84, 84 nanoseconds. And um, if you look at um, the histogram numbers, um, those are 100, 22 nanoseconds for a single bucket or zero bucket histogram. Um, it scales pretty well with the number of buckets. So the, the number behind the slash is the number of buckets that the histogram has. Um, and then if you look at um, the collection itself, um, so answering the scrape, and that actually doesn't really scale that well with the number of buckets, but that's okay because it only happens once per minute. And it also happens on a different thread um, because um, we don't want to make the hot path slow when somebody's scraping these. Um, so I, I said those are implemented uh, implemented as atomics. Um, of course, there is it's not free to increment an atomic, right? It can it can there's a memory fence. Um, depending on your architecture, it can potentially thre uh, treasure cache lines and, and stuff like that, but um, we found that it's actually pretty, like for what we get out of it, it's a pretty reasonable um, performance impact and trade-off for us so far. Um, so is the whole set of counters atomic in the sense that you, when you take the snapshot or um, is this the atomicity or only for a single counter? Yeah, excellent question. Um, it's not atomic on its own. So you, you might get some data that's a little bit off. In the scheme of things, um, I think that's okay. That's a that's one of the trade-offs that are that are made. It's a very really good question. Have you tried uh, to use a thread local counter uh, to be non-atomic? So because you only need to sum all these threaded counters when you collect the data, and not every time it's incremented. So incrementing basically would increment the memory and not be atomic. Yeah, great question. So um, I think that would that might be more optimal in a lot of cases. Um, but there's also really good, like real value in this being a thread safe operation. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a trade off. So there are no implementations for for thread local ones. A lot of the ones that we use, uh, we we use them from we increment them from different threads. Yeah, so and so most of this implementation, um, I, I of course I didn't in, like invent this from scratch. Um, there are lots of like there are lots of implementations in other languages, and I mostly followed their model um, because I yeah it's, I mean C plus plus is special, but I think fundamentally it's probably the use case of people writing Go servers are not that that different to people writing C plus plus servers. Yeah, but, but uh, we take pull requests <clears throat> with this core count going up. Like now we have 64 real cores on, on mm -hmm. a thread wrapper, and the congestion in atomic counters that is used by 64 threads will be mm -hmm. very hard. Yeah, so we will. I agree. But I think you at least have to read the counter from a different thread because the web server is uh, running in that. Yeah, so that way a thread local probably won't help you. I think. 
trading really the issue? Because I mean, if you're scraping every second, then in one case you might just get an old value. You get the uh, better version next time, right? So it's a best effort principle in any way, right? Yeah, exactly. And so if if the server runs long enough, then these counters will be really high. And I think, um, yeah, depending on what you want to do with it, it might be really problematic. But then if you really rely on data that's so super accurate, you you might want to approach the whole problem differently anyway, I think. So I don't know if um, one thing just to just to visualize this. So these counters, like all, like all of these in the histogram buckets, for example, they're not incremented as a, they're, they're implemented in incremented in some sort of for loop. And it might be that a scrape comes in when we are only here with increment with incrementing them, right? And then you might get interestingly weird data, but if these counters are, if they have six digits, then you probably don't care that much. All right, any more, any more questions on the implementation or um, the part? You can also, I'll also take questions afterwards if, um, um, if you want. Do you support to restore the counters after you restart the server or is it always starting with zero once the server is restarted and you lose the last bit of data? Um, we do not support this. Um, normally, when I, I'm going to talk about how how the query how queries work, um, in Prometheus anyway. So normally, when you ha in a lot of use cases, you don't care about the single server. In a lot of cases, you care about the help of several servers, um, and you accumulate this data from several servers, um, and yeah, so it's it's not restored. If you want need to reset it in the while well, your your application is running, you you have to um, basically recreate the registry. Does does for example the counter overflow, or it stays on the top value? It's a really good question. So I've I've been getting this I've been getting this one a lot from people in code reviews. It's uh, it's the, the counters themselves are in, implemented as doubles. Um, so if you do the math, you have you have a lot of you, you need to increment a lot of counters for these to overflow. It's probably it's, it doesn't happen in, in practice unless you say again. How many years do you need to increment? It's an interview question. Yeah, so it's a really big number, but yeah, I don't. I cannot jump that. Yeah, I don't. I don't know from the top of my head, but it's it's many it's many millions of years. I mean, you, so the the increment actually also takes a value. So if you're incremented by really large values all the time, then it can overflow. I guess I guess it cannot overflow in uh, for a double, but it will it will not change value anymore. Right. So if the if the mantissa is if if the exponent is big enough, then it, it won't change anymore. But I think so. This has been found to not be a problem in practice, <laughs> probably by Google in the early two thousands. So um, so sorry. One, one more nitpick about the histogram. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I understand you. You write it to. To when you scrape it, you want to have it accumulated for for easier, um, you know, picking one value. But why don't you just store it internally, and when you uh, generate the scrape, you accumulate it because you have to go linearly through the entire histogram anyway. So you could just accumulate it on the fly while generating the scrape. Do we do this, Gregor? The, the, then you wouldn't have the problem with the atomicity prop things you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure we actually do this already. I'm gonna check now. <laughs> we take also we also take pull requests. <laughs> yeah, yeah, really, really great suggestion. But I mean, so still like depending on what your data looks like, it can still be inconsistent between different counters, for example, yes. right? So 
and that's very tough to prevent. I mean, yeah, expensive. It's, yeah, expensive, exactly. Um, so, um, oh, so any any more? I I just take questions in the end, and there are probably going to be a few more. I just want to show you a bunch of queries, um, example queries, and then a bunch of screenshots of what you can do with the data. Um, again, not real, not real actual. It's kind of toy data. Um, this is when I first put it in the audio bridge. Um, this is Grafana. Um, I don't know if you know it. It's pretty popular open source software for building dashboards. Um, it can it can talk to the Prometheus server. Um, Prometheus server itself also has a has a GUI, um, a web a web UI um, where you can plot data. It's not as comfortable and feature complete as this one, but it's it's really nice for writing queries and prototyping. Um, so let's see. Um, this one, um, active connections, a gauge. Um, ABTP3 is uh, audio video transfer protocol. It's the, been the first log use case for that we instrumented at LogMeIn. It's a, it's a transport stack. Um, sends audio and video packets around. Um, so because we have counters, um, we use counters for connection created and connection closed. So if you look at the Prometheus documentation, they oftentimes recommend using counters over gauges when possible. Um, just because you have it you have more information that you can you can use. Um, for example, so if you if you get this if you collect this data as two counters, you can do things like compute the time derivative of connections created, and that would give you the connection connection rate, like the, the amount that your connections increased. So you can you can do a little bit more things um, when when you have the more simple data type and you you put the complexity of these calculations into the query. So yeah, the active connections we, we compute by subtracting the two. Um, so in this like this text here, this is a, an, a database query to the Prometheus time series database that you would put in the settings panel for, for this gauge, or that you would paste in the in the Prometheus GUI. Okay, what else do we have? Um, the sum of um, created, of channels created and um, channels closed. Um, so yeah, channels are a connection has channels, um, audio audio channels, video channels. Um, why do we write some here? And we do write some here because um, this matrix family has uh, labels. So we have um, different counters for audio channels, video channels, and data channels. So if we want to have the number of active channels for the whole server, we 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 sum up all of these. And this basically take, says take all the everything that's named this way um, with all the lab, with all labeled pairs and just compute the sum of it. Right. So yeah, this is the actual value um, of connections of connections created. Um, this when this goes down here. So this is where the server would shut down um, or be restarted or something, something like that. Oops. Maybe I have not run my slides. Okay, so yeah, this is another interesting one. Um, this is uh, transferred bytes is a histogram. Um, so every time we send an audio packet or receive an audio packet or any packet, we observe the number of bytes in that packet. Um, so if we want to have something like all the num all the bytes that the server have ever has ever sent, um, then we can um, use the underscore sum uh, metrics that the histogram provides. That I had that earlier in the text re representation, if you remember. And then um, now maybe here we are interested in splitting it up a little bit by label pairs. Um, for for the transfer bytes, we have the direction of incoming, 
um, direction of outgoing and um, protocol, whether it's a UDP packet or a TCP packet. Um, and then you can you can plot them all in the same in the same diagram. Then um, one really nice thing about the Prometheus server is uh, and the the database um, under there is that it, it's pretty efficient at computing time derivatives, and it has to be because all we are doing is counters, and those are not the most interesting. Like in a lot of ways, um, we wouldn't really want something like this on a real dashboard, right? Nobody cares about all the bytes the server has ever sent. What we probably care more about bandwidth, like what's the what's the current bandwidth um, that the server is sending or or receiving. Um, so you can use the irate function, and irate um, does compute the time derivative on the um, the thing that you pass it. I'm just gonna skip over this because you get short on time. Um, one really interesting one that I actually wrote last week um, is so we did have some some life issues where we um, were suspecting that we had a problem in one of our concurrency libraries um, or something that uses the library. So um, we had a problem that we, we thought some tasks and some proce packet processing was delayed sometimes. Um, so we, we wanted to create an alerting for this to see when it happens. And what we ended up with is, um, there's the histogram quanti uh, quantile function. Um, and what it does is it, comp does, does people know what quantiles are in, in the probability distribution? Um, so the, the, the quantile is the point at which, um, I need a white, do you have a whiteboard? Um, so basically the 0.5 quantile is the median. Does anybody know the median? It's the it's the the thing where the probability distribution has the same um, amount of things on the on the left side and on the right side, basically, right? And the that's 0 0.5, and we we were really interested about the tail end, the the slowest one percent of tasks, how long they had to wait to be processed, and um, the Prometheus server allows you to formulate this as a query, so. Um, We were interested in um, how long did these tasks take, um, and we plotted this, and we saw that when some in Grafana you can add events; those are um, these green lines that they do not come from Prometheus; they come from other sources. Um, we saw that when some specific events happened, like the red, the ones with the red lines here, that we actually that those correlated with a spike in the um, in the tail, um, in the tail latency for when these tasks were processed. So it's <laughs> does anybody? So do you understand? Do you understand what this what what this means and what you what you can do with it? It's really when. Um, You have time here, and this is the probability for it. You have some 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 distribution here, and we were really interested. Um, so the the area under here is 0.99, and this one is um, area here is 0 0.01, and we were really interested in at which at which time, like what the request latency was, where where this point is that where we can divide it up. That 0.99 is is here. Um, so it's really cool when you do have an actual production problem that you already have all this data stored in the database and then um, you can go investigate. And sometimes it takes a lot of the data looks really weird and then you, you tweak the query and at some point you find something that really helps you track the bug down. And um, yeah, I hope you've learned something about it and um, hopefully you use it when you think it's helpful for you and your work. And if you if you use it, um, let me know. I'm always happy to to know that people people use that. And we take pull requests. Um, thank you for your attention. And yeah, if you have any more questions, let me know.
Um, if you want the slides, there are the slides. And thanks for coming.